So let's talk about uh, Biden and Trump then. We'll sure. expand upon this. You're mm -hmm. you're you're super excited for Biden. Uh, yes. Oh yeah. Why? Um, for every so one, I think that we will finally, hopefully, have some cohesive idea of how we're supposed to deal with the coronavirus as a country from somebody that is not insane when it comes to talking about virus related stuff. So no weird stuff about bleach or UV lights, no pushing <laughs> weird medications like hydroxychloroquine that he didn't take when he was sick. No, did, did, he was reported that he took it. Uh, no, he said he took it as a prophylactic. Oh, oh right, before he got sick. But when right. he actually yes, got yes. sick, he yeah. got the good stuff. He didn't get Regeneron. that weird stuff that he was selling all the suckers on TV that worship and support him. Um, well, but hey, hydroxychloroquine has been used for decades. It is considered not for COVID-19 for sure, for sure. So there were preliminary studies. This, this is the craziest thing about the news cycle and how they deal with Trump. There was actually TechCrunch and several uh, European outlets that reported a promising study showing hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, you know, com and with zinc in combination was showing uh, that the severity was reducing. They actually replicated this in other studies. Trump comes out and just starts repeating it. And then all of a sudden the media flipped on it. <clears throat> so we, we, even saw, we, we even saw lefties write about this saying, it is the weirdest thing. The moment Trump says something about a news report, the media changes the narrative and says it's a bad thing. Because May well, the problem is it's not Trump's job to be saying these things. If a random TechCrunch article wants to come out and say, hey, there was some retrospective analysis done on hydroxychloroquine and antibiotics like azithromycin. No, 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 no. It was literally whatever. a study on COVID. And they found all, the severity was dramatically reduced. All of the prospective studies done on hydroxychloroquine have showed that it is nothing. It does not help with the severity of the disease. There have been some retrospectives that when compared against different standards of care, like maybe, but the, the reason why it became popular initially was because that scientist in um, France, the doctor um, yeah. Raoul, came out with his, like, N equals 12 study that I think he dropped one person from that died. And after like one week in, he was like, hey, we published the results. There, there, and then like, that was it. There, but, there was a, a ton of past research that said for coronavirus... And, and for like SARS-CoV-1, mm -hmm. hydroxychloroquine was effective in reducing severity. Sure. This probably led the scientists to say, let's try it out for SARS-CoV-2. Which is good. They were promising results early on. But as soon as Trump said it, the media went nuts. That's because the crazy thing. Trump's, because Trump no, is a different on, person on. and it's not his job. I'll, I'll so, here, wait, so here's part of the problem when Trump comes out and says it. When Trump comes out and says something that hasn't been thoroughly vetted by the medical community and isn't recommended by somebody who would be more in line to recommend that, like say somebody like Fauci, right? When Trump comes out and says it, it changes the worldwide discourse when it comes to these drugs. So there was a really good article published in Nature about some research scientists that complained about how hard it was when they were trying to run trials on other drugs. So dex, dexamethasone and um, remdesivir or other drugs, nobody wants to be in the loser trials. Everybody wants to be in the hydroxychloroquine <laughs> trials. That's what Trump was talking about. Yeah. Why, nobody wants to risk being in the dummy trial for some loser drug when Trump is on TV talking about how he's taking hydroxychloroquine every day. Like, it's not his job to do that. He's absolutely but, irresponsible look, for him to Trump, be on TV talking about that. I, I disagree. I mean, he's going to talk about what he sees in the news. It, it, I'm not going to blame it, the what, president. Is he like a Muppet? He sees something and he says something? This is like the most powerful man in the world. I think that we can be a little but bit everybody more critical. Does. What do you mean? What Trump is not everybody. But Trump he, is the he, president of the United States. And and he did he, he gave a speech where he said, We're doing a great job. we we're seeing some promising studies out of France. There's a hydroxychloroquine they're they're talking about. Should he not tell people that we're making developments and there's some promising, you know, medications? The problem is that even if I was to grant you that, it stands in stark contrast to the reasons why he gave for never talking about the coronavirus initially, right? Like he's saying that like, oh, well, Didn't I kept all this stuff panic. secret panic. because I don't want to start a panic, blah, blah, blah. but now he's out here talking about all these potential miracle drugs and everything. Like, I, I just, I think that it Dude. is very irresponsible for him. Like, I even get nervous talking about like certain medications on my stream because I don't want people to run out taking, and I know I have that power and I'm not the president of the United States. Right, but I always just say, ask your doctor. The exactly. doctor knows best for you. Which is great. And if Trump know. said that, you know, like, hey, there are drugs out there that might be trying to talk to your doctor. But that's not what he was saying. He was talking about, oh, we got hydroxychloroquine, this great new miracle drug. And I think it's going to be the next. Do you remember? Like, well, who are you to say Do you remember that? what the White House said on school closures? The science is on our side. And Anderson Cooper, I think, said something to the effect of he just doesn't, doesn't care about your children at all. Um, I think Jennifer Rubin said he wants your kids to die or something like that. This was actually what Kaylee McEnany brought up in, in a press briefing. Mind uh -huh. you, that's one. So I, I remember that, that narrative when Trump uh, and, and the White House came out and said, schools should stay open. Well, now we're finding out that even Fauci is saying, yep, but so much later that we've caused irreparable damage to many people's lives and families. And there's been suicides when Trump was actually right the whole time. To was that irresponsible people, when, when they said that that people time? Can say different, people can say the same thing for very different reasons. Like, it's very obvious 
that Trump is pushing to open schools because he's desperate to get back to some level of normalcy for the election. Because whether you agree or disagree with Trump, this election, to a large extent, was probably a referendum on how he dealt with the coronavirus and getting yeah. people back in schools and getting people working. Because a lot of people don't know this. Um, schools are can be two very important things for families. One, it's how your kid can eat sometimes, depending on how poor you are. And two, um, it lets mom and dad go and work. Daycare. Because, yeah, yeah you know, daycare. daycare is unbelievably expensive. Oh, my yep. goodness. So public um, schools allows yeah, the economy the, to keep moving. Yeah, but the the problem is, is that when you're pushing for things on only a political basis, and it doesn't seem like you're laying out like good comprehensive plans for like, um, so for instance, like Fauci and um, I think it was even on the White House Talk site, have like these plans for like slowly reopening based on the number of reported cases, daily averages, moving, blah, blah, blah. Like if that was the type of thing that was being said, then I could have been more empathetic. I was like, okay, cool. It seems like Trump just wants to reopen things in a responsible way. But instead it was just like, we got to open all the schools. We got to get them back. We got to get back to normal. It was like, probably not like the most science driven answer he was given. I mean... It's an, it's an opinion. The people who like Trump are going to say Trump cares about me and he's fighting for my family. The people who don't are going to say he only cares about the Why economy. Why didn't Trump pressure McConnell to release any stimulus if he cares about our family so much? Maybe he doesn't think stimulus is the right way to help families. And he thought that it would be devastating to the economy to just print money. And the best way to do it was to release the lockdowns, which is what but Trump said. But he thought said. it wasn't devastating to the economy to just cut taxes for like all the wealthy businesses or to authorize the PPP loans. He or... thought that was good for the economy. Okay. Like, like pe people think they're the heroes of their own story. You know what I mean? Sure, like, I understand. I'm just, it's strange the, the, that he thought that these were such positive measures, but he couldn't pressure McConnell to release any kind of stimulus to the average American person. I think he said that the stimulus will be the vaccine and we need to reopen because people should be working. So it's just, there's, I don't think there's mustache twirling villainy. I think. I Trump, don't think there's mustache twirling. I think he's just selfish and stupid. But the problem is we are months and months into this and we got no other stimulus. He is you, our leader. Where was it? How do you feel about Fauci saying uh, early on that he was doing the best possible, that no one could do better? Every time somebody contradicts Trump, they get immediately fired. Look at the, um, I think it was the cybersecurity head of the DHS that came out and said, well, this yeah, election was Krebs. actually pretty secure and Trump instantly fired him. So it's not yeah. surprising to me that Fauci, man, that's been working in government for what, like 30 or 40 years or something, that he came out and was like, oh yeah, I think Trump but is he's, doing- he's been defying him for months. He has been defying it, but that's, there's a very careful line you have to skirt. If you've ever worked a corporate job and you've got totally. an idiot manager, you know, like you don't go out and say like, why are you doing this? It's stupid. It's more like, maybe I, like, do. I think you're doing a great, <laughs> I get fired. Sure. Yeah. Well, if you don't <laughs> want to get fired, it's more like you're doing an amazing job. I think we could do a little bit better here. Right. So, of so course, you think, you think Fauci lied to the American people to save his own job? Oof. I think that Fauci was saying things in the most diplomatic manner possible because he wanted to serve the American people. And I saying, get immediately fired by Trump, saying, which he would. Saying Trump did the best possible job and no one could do better is a big difference from we're trying as, as hard as we can. I don't I know if he said no one could do better. I, I would be or better. I would be curious what the exact quote is. But even so, I don't think that's very relevant to policy going forward, whether or not Fauci says that Trump did a good or bad job. I don't know if it's Fauci's job in government to be second guessing the president in his past decisions. It's Fauci's job to give us the best leadership going forward. And I know that there have been times where Fauci, and you just said it, right, has been at ends with the president and him like promoting certain drugs or him talking about certain things related to the coronavirus where Fauci says, well, I disagree here or whatever. And even I'm pretty sure there were a few months where we didn't see Fauci anymore because of his yeah. like behind the scenes fighting with Trump. But yeah, I, I don't think that just saying, well, Fauci said Trump was doing a good job. Like, wow, you think like Trump, the guy that fires literally every single person so, in government that's not immediately agreeing with him, like it doesn't surprise me that he was like a little bit careful when he would publicly address Trump. So on that note, the cybersecurity mm -hmm. guy that Trump just fired, would it not have been in his best interest to say this was the most secure election we've ever had? That's literally him saying, I did a good job. Don't fire me. Um, but th it's that type of thing is it's very hard. Um, so like there's like two schools of thought in terms of like how to change a system. Do you go full renegade and say, this sucks, this is over, fire me, I don't care. Or do you kind of like suck it up, work from the inside, you know, like, okay, well, sure, this sucks. But like, if, as long as I like keep my you know mouth shut, I can actually enact change on the inside. Like, um, when the DHS guy came out and said what he said, I think that he probably felt an obligation to the American people to let them know the government doesn't stand behind Trump and his like uh, election fraud claims. So. I feel like that doesn't surprise so, me. So I'll read a little bit. He said, <clears throat> uh -huh. Fauci said, we've never had a threat like this. And the coordinated response has been, there are a number of adjectives to describe it. Impressive, I think is one of them. I mean, we're talking about all hands on deck is that I, as one of many people on the team, I'm not the only person since the beginning that we've recognized what this was. I have been devoting almost, uh, almost full time on this, almost all, almost full time. I'm down at the White House virtually every day with the task force. I'm connected by phone throughout the day and into the night. And when I say night, I'm talking 12, 1, 2 in the morning, not just 1. So I can't imagine that under any circumstance that anybody could be doing more. I mean, obviously, we're fighting a formidable enemy. This virus, this virus is a serious issue here. Take a look at what's done to China. And, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he goes into it's a really long. I don't want to read the full uh, 
it's a really long paragraph. Sure. The it gist sounds of which to me is, like he's like, as the as who's kind of become the face of this virus, he's like champion, like, yeah, we're doing everything we can the government, which is kind of what I would expect him to do, is to be like a cheerleader for the government. I don't expect him to come out and like, these guys suck, our coordinated federal response, but non-existent. Trump is a horrible leader. Like, I don't think that would be his job. And it would probably send a bad message to the American people as well. Right? If, if, you know, the critis- criticism of Trump is that he was downplaying this early on to avoid a panic and that was a bad thing, then isn't there responsibility on Fauci? The problem with tr- if you want to say that you're downplaying something to avoid panic, that's fine. But the problem was is that while he was downplaying it, there weren't steps being taken behind the scenes to prepare us for what was coming. It seemed less like downplaying it to avoid a panic and more pretending it didn't exist and hope it didn't come to American shores. Because there's a difference between publicly saying like, okay, guys, listen, I don't think this is going to be a big deal. And then behind the scenes, you're like, okay, listen, we need to get testing on board. We need to make sure that we have some form of contact tracing. We need to like communicate with governors, make sure we have some, like there would be that. But instead it was just like, well, look, we locked down travel from China, LOL. And then in a month and a half, we did nothing. Oh, well, we look, we locked down travel from, uh, um, from Europe, LOL. And like, that's it. Like, I, I don't think that he was just trying to avoid a panic because there was nothing going on behind the scenes scenes in that gap of the China and European travel ban to show that he was taking it seriously. It seemed he just didn't think it was a real thing. Let's talk about Biden. Sure. What do you uh, what do you like about Biden? Um, so one thing was the top down, um, hopefully some t- sort of top down level um, response we get for related to the coronavirus um, that respects court rulings and everything. I know I don't know if we've talked about it yet on air, but the Supreme Court did decide that it's really mentioned of, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. religious freedoms, which is probably fine. I, I can understand that ruling from the Supreme Court. Um, I would hope that churches would individually say like, okay, well maybe we'll you know suspend sessions, but I can understand that. Um, but some top down coordinated response from um, the government related to coronavirus um, number two. And three are close going to be intertwined is going to be like the economy broadly and healthcare broadly. Um, I'm very interested to see what sort of economic policies we're going to see from Biden, especially in regards to his strong support of unions and especially in regards to I don't personally like the policy, but pushing for a 15 an hour minimum wage. I'm very curious to see like where that ends up. In terms Bad of, news. Why do you say that? So he wants to combine that with a high corporate tax. Yes, ah, that's bad. And he's also been as, as part of the Obama administration, very mm-hmm. much in favor of free trade agreements. I love free trade agreements. Well, so you know what the combination of those three things will get you. <clears throat> Corporations um, facing high wage costs and high mm-hmm. taxes will just move their, their factories and their, their businesses overseas. Well, that's part of what you have baked into any multilateral trade agreement, though, is right. the idea that... Um, so um, nobody talks about this on the right or the left. One of the nice things about free trade agreements or multilateral trade agreements is that, obviously, what you just said can happen, okay? you um, If you're going to make it so that I can export my supply chain to a place like Vietnam, well... <laughs> I'm just going to make all my stuff over there because I can pay those workers way less. However, generally, as part of negotiating these free trade agreements, you usually demand some, sorry, some labor standards um, on the uh, side of other countries in order to bring them onto a more level playing field so that you're not exporting um, all of those jobs. So two really good examples of this is one is that the U.M. Uh, I can't remember the United States, Mexico, U.M. Uh, USMCA. Yeah, USMCA, the yeah. United States, Mexico, Canada. Free agreement, trade agreement, agreement. Whatever, yeah, agreement. Yeah. Um, so part of this agreement that Trump champions all the time was um, I think they demanded like uh, uh, an increase in wages for Mexican workers that worked in certain factories to, t- to try to dissuade people from exporting too many jobs over there. Um, and then another good example is part of the negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, obviously dead now, but part of those were historic labor reforms in Vietnam that would have bolstered a lot of the labor rights in, in that country. And a lot of those just completely went away as a result of the TPP negotiations falling through. It's good, but, for, good for Vietnam, but it's not good for American workers. Um, well, if you force them to pay their workers more, it is good for American workers because the increased liberalization of trade means we have another trading partner that we can buy and sell stuff from. But the fact that you have to pay their workers more means we're not just shipping all of those jobs overseas because they still have some minimum level of wages that they have to pay to discourage that. There, there, the, there may be those negotiations on labor rights, but mm-hmm. the, the cost is still remarkably cheaper to have our factories all throughout Southeast Asia than here in the United States. And we've, we've seen that. We've seen the I mean, fact de- that we don't produce our own medicine anymore. Sure. I mean, it, it, this this is one of those like insanely multifaceted things that I agree with you in practice. It becomes a lot easier to spread supply chains throughout the world because it's cheaper in certain areas to manufacture it. That's not always a bad thing, but it's also a thing that we could combat if we would have more honest conversations about like what is a multilateral free trade agreement supposed to, to accomplish. So for instance, the Paris Climate Accords. So very common criticism that nobody on the left talks about um, is that these things seem to give a lot of leeway to developing nations. Like why would I join any type of... Uh, uh, pollution, you know, restriction thing that's going to let China and India compete uninhibited with now my shackled economy that can't pollute. Right. Like this is insane. Um, so, like, but but the only way that we can address those types of concerns have to come through multilateral trade agreements. That's it. There's no other way to do it. China is way too big as a country. A, a few tariffs or a couple sanctions aren't going to do anything to them. They have access to the rest of the world market. Um, you have to get together with a bunch of countries to set these standards. It didn't. It didn't work. 
We we, we, we thought that these are the, 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 the trade with China mm -hmm. was going to normalize China and make them freer and better. And nah. they went the other direction. Well, so there, this has been something I've read about this since the 90s. This has always been like the China conspiracy. People are always saying, I, I say conspiracy, people are always saying that like when China, uh, when the middle class booms, when they increase their trade, like they're going to become more liberal, the people are going to demand political freedoms. Doesn't seem to have happened. But I don't think we necessarily need those things to happen. I think we can acknowledge that China exists as this kind of like, you know, authoritarian behemoth that is going to do what it's going to do. But the only way that we can accurately deal with that is to partner with other countries in order to enforce like the kinds of restrictions that we want on them. We can't do it on our own. Like we've seen Trump try to do it with tariffs. It doesn't really work that well. He keeps saying over and over again, we brought them to the table, but like not really. The big things that we were pushing for related to like intellectual property rights, I think we didn't see any progress there whatsoever. China continues its Belt Road Initiative all throughout Europe and Asia and everything. Like it's either we, either there. I think there's two outcomes in this 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 China uh, issue: mm -hmm. full scale warfare or capitulation. Okay, how I'm going to suggest kindly a third option. What if instead of every single time something bad happens in the world and we all hide from each other and get scared and locked down, what if we continue to reach out, be the world leader that we used to be in the whole NATO world and everything, where we tell other countries like, hey, let's all work together on this common idea, and then we pressure China that way. Couldn't that be like a better way to do things? But has, hasn't that been exactly what they've been trying to do that's not been working? Well, I mean, there have been a few key events, especially recently, that have kind of pushed people into a, 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 a lot more kind of a, a scary area where they're worried about working people. So the 2013 Syrian refugee crisis, for instance, caused a whole wave of, of governments in Europe to have— Thanks, right Obama. People, yeah. Well, um, to some extent, yeah. Um, although Bush got us largely involved with the Middle East originally. But Syria was Obama. Yeah, all of it. Oh, oh, it's complicated. Um, well, I'm sorry. You're right. It was the CIA. No, that's too communist. Um, no, no. It, 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 this so is, I mean, like the, the existence the of like the existence of like ISIS that exists in Syria and gains power in Syria. Like, like a lot of that came from the destabilization that started in Iraq, and a lot of that came from you know. Bush yeah. that got us into Iraq. I'm not saying that For Obama sure. is absolved of this. I think that Obama could have done a better job foreign policy wise, but it's hard. It's very difficult, and nobody has gotten that right. Um, do you know? Do you know about the Qatar Turkey pipeline? Um, I believe I've heard of this, but talk this to me the, more about it. The reason why the U.S. got involved in Syria well because before. the idea was to get Syria locked down so that they could run that pipeline from from yeah, yeah through, all, all through, yeah. through, 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 through I've Syria through Turkey. Heard this from people, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's it's true. In 2009, um, I think it was actually no, maybe it was uh, yeah, 2009. The Guardian reported this, that in 2009, U.S. intelligence said, we will have a ground incursion in Syria because they have refused to give us access to build the pipeline, saying that they would not go against their ally Russia. What Russia and Syria were then planning on doing was using Iran to tap the same well and run that pipeline into Europe, strengthening the Russian gas monopoly in Europe. So the U.S. had a plan for years before we actually ended up on the ground. And then funneling weapons to rebel groups, eventually built it, they eventually came together and we got isis that that is a story that one could tell but i don't think that everything that happened in syria was just a result of the united states wanting to no, no, get, no. like secure an area for that pipeline that might there, have there been was, like a there nice was a, side objective that maybe could have come about i know that the united states probably wanted to see assad gone and if definitely. he was gone it wouldn't surprise me if he wanted somebody loyal to america or american interest in there and if that did happen let me let me clarify sure. mm -hmm. The Guardian reported that in 2009, the U.S. wanted to be in Syria. They sure. needed an opportunity to do it. When the Arab Spring happened, the United States said, now's our chance. Provided weapons and resources to the rebels, eventually put U.S. soldiers on the ground. Now we're involved in that. And the same, and look, oh, oh, uh, that, that's why, you know, getting into the Biden discussion about war and conflict, mm -hmm. bringing up the Syrian refugee crisis was a product of, yes, Bush, totally, and o Obama ramped things up. Um, in regards to the Syrian stuff, yeah. For sure. Um, in regards to <clears throat> another reason why I say foreign policy is complicated is like a lot of people are critical about Obama and the um, and all of the drone strikes and the killings. Was it um, an American citizen? I think we killed in Yemen. The uh, we killed. Or I think I think Obama killed four American citizens. Yeah, I, oh. I know there was one that was like super ultra heated. That 16, really 16 year old in, in Yemen. Yes, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Obama signed off on blowing up a civilian restaurant in a country we aren't at war with. And when they when they asked him, why did you kill? Why did you sign off on killing the 16 year old? Mm -hmm. They said, we were trying to target somebody else, a, a terrorist leader. Oops. When people followed up saying, why did you authorize a drone strike on a civilian restaurant in a country we aren't at war with? It's just womp. Sure. 
All those same drone strikes and all those same bombings have only increased under Trump, though. Not in the past few years, but yes, yeah, absolutely in the past few years. No, they've, ran, they've, the, they've the, actually been going down quite a they, bit. They might have gone down from where they started the administration, but in the four years we've had Trump, in his first four years, he has done more drone strikes and more foreign bombing than either Obama or Bush You're did. You're correct, and, and hiring Bolton was the stupidest yep, thing the man could have done. we still have troops in Afghanistan. We still have troops in Iraq. But he's trying we to take them out. In Syria. What do you mean he's trying to? He's been trying to get rid of them for a long time. Why hasn't he? Because did you know that there was a White House, there was a federal official who lied about the amount of troops we had in Syria to trick Trump into keeping them there? And that when Trump said he was ordering the troops to withdraw from Afghanistan, both Democrats and Republicans got together and blocked him in Congress. Trump fired the Pentagon civilian leadership, and this was reported by the AP, in an effort to get loyalists who would finally pull our troops out of these countries. I, this is one of those things where I wish I knew more information about it, but I, am, I completely do not agree that that is even remotely possible. You are telling me that the president of the United States that was able to get the Supreme Court to say, well, I can tear off China for national security reasons, couldn't control where we were deploying or withdrawing troops troops from. Um, that sounds unbelievable, you, you, especially when he was like you, unilaterally approving strikes me, on like Soleimani and like Iraqi airports and stuff. I know, it's messed like, up stuff for sure. I find it very hard to believe. It wouldn't surprise me if Trump was using this as an excuse, but I mean, even if this was true, like you've got a guy that says he's a business leader that's supposed to be on top of handling all this stuff, who like one guy lies to him and now he has no control over his military. He's the commander in chief. It's literally the primary job of the president. There, 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 there are a lot of people in government who are doing everything in their power to obstruct Trump. And we most of them are Trump right appointees. Yeah, I know. It's it's one of these, Trump's hired a bunch of dumb people. So at like, what come on, point, man. But you have the, to the fact ask that he yourself, hired Bolton. It's but like you have to ask yourself at one point: is it no longer the deep state's fault? When the deep state is fifty percent Trump appointees, maybe Trump is just highly incompetent. Thanks for checking out this clip from the Timcast IRL podcast. We do the show live Monday through Friday at eight PM. So come back to check us out when we go live. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit the like button. Hit the notification bell, and we are also available on all podcast platforms for free if you want to listen to us there. Thanks for hanging out, and we will see you all next time.